This is Professor Ann Spihar, Assistant Professor of Economics from the University of Alaska Southeast. This is a lecture in Ecological Economics, Chapter 6 from the textbook Ecological Economics Principles and Applications by Herman Daly and Joshua Farley. This is Part 3 from Chapter 6. We will discuss ecosystem services and waste absorption capacity. In this lecture of Part 3, we will focus on the last two of the three basic categories of biotic resources. Ecosystem services, defined as the ecosystem functions that are of value to humans and generated as emergent phenomena by the interacting elements of ecosystem structure. And waste absorption capacity, an ecosystem service that is sufficiently distinct from the others to warrant separate treatment. Again, an ecosystem is composed first of its structure and functions. We know that, for example, a forest is composed of trees that are an aspect of the structure of an ecosystem and is also a renewable biotic resource. But it is the functions that are created by the ecosystem structure that allows an entire forest ecosystem to thrive and grow. We may be able to control the degree to which we extract trees by closely attending to a sustainable yield curve, as discussed in the last lecture, but this sustainable yield curve may not account for the more broad-based ecosystem functions and services that a forest provides. We may be able to regenerate trees, but will the regeneration ensure sustainability of all the ecosystem functions and services that are provided within this forest, both locally and perhaps even globally, as a result of these ecosystem functions? An excessive rate of flow extracted from a stock like trees, from a forest, or even fish from the sea, affects not just the stock and its ability to provide a flow in the future, but this extraction also impacts the fund services the forest provides, to which the stock partially contributes. Scientists are unsure exactly how ecosystem structure creates ecosystem functions or even how it gives rise to them. But what we do know is that many ecosystem functions are of very high value to economic production processes and even critical to the survival of the human species. So we call an ecosystem function that has value to human beings an ecosystem service. And importantly, humans are often completely unaware of the services that ecosystems create and generate. Excessive rates of flow of stock resources may ensure sustainability of stock, but may not sustain the functions to which the stock contributes. This interdependence between structure and function, and thus structure and ecosystem services, is very complex. We categorize ecosystem services into four categories. Provisioning, which, for example, might be the production of food and water. Regulating, for example, the control of climate and disease. Supporting, for example, nutrient cycles and crop pollination. And finally, cultural, the spiritual and recreational benefits humans receive. Let's talk about a few of the ways that a forest can provide important ecological services. For example, trees protect water quality in two important ways. First of all, roots and leaf litter stabilize soils. They protect the soil from raindrop impact, increase porosity, eliminate overland flow and sediment transport. And secondly, the shade from the leafy canopy helps lower surface water temperature. It slows the evaporation of surface waters, which is beneficial for aquatic wildlife like trout that need cooler water. Forested soils, wetlands, and floodplains also aid in flood control and important water purification. They also support the water cycle as well as support habitat for a wide array of wildlife. Clean water also creates important services that support important cultural and spiritual elements within communities. There are many critical ecological services that forests provide food webs and energy flows, water regulation, local and regional climate support, numerous habitats and niches, as well as air purification. And, of course, we can't forget the cultural and spiritual activities that it provides as well. These are the kinds of ecosystem services that must be considered when evaluating the sustainable yield curve and appropriate 
and appropriate harvest levels that the yield curve indicates. Does the critical depensation and maximum sustainable yield values consider all of the ecosystem services that a forest provides? You can begin to see why these yield curves are complex and difficult to use in practice. Your textbook offers many more critical ecosystem services to consider and provide excellent examples of just such services in the Table 6.1. Ecosystem services are a fun service. Let's review for a moment the difference between a stock flow resource and a fund service resource to get a better understanding of just what a fund service is. If you'll recall, stock flow resources are materially transformed into what it produces, and we call this idea material cause. Stock flow resources can also be stockpiled for later use and provides a flow of materials for the economic processes. Typically, stock flow resources are measured in magnitudes of the stock itself, how much timber is needed, how much flour is needed in the pizza, and it measures the magnitude of the stock used in the production process by the amount produced per unit of stock. And stock flow resources are used up in the production process and Finally, all stock flow resources are considered rival. On the other hand, fund service resources are not embodied in what is produced and they are not materially transformed into what is produced. We refer to this as efficient cause. They cannot be stockpiled and they provide services. The labor that goes into it, the labor itself, isn't embodied within the pizza. And typically, it measures the use as a rate of time physical output of the goods per unit of time. Fund service resources are thus typically worn out, not used up. Now, all non-rival goods are considered a fund service, but notice that not all fund service goods are non-rival. I've provided a Venn diagram here for you. You can see that all non-rival goods are contained within the Venn diagram of fund service goods, meaning that if it's non-rival, then it's also a fund service good. But there do exist fund service goods that are not considered non-rival. Stock flow resources, on the other hand, are always rival. If it's a stock flow resource or good, then it is considered a rival good. This is review from the previous chapters. When we harvest a biological stock from an ecosystem, we are changing the capacity of the ecosystem to produce more stock and the capacity for the ecosystem to provide services critical to our survival. A forest is not simply a grove of trees. It is an ecosystem that provides critical services like water purification and recycling, carbon sequestration, all of which help support climate stability. Typical of a fund service, we cannot use up climate stability in the act of cutting down trees. We cannot use climate stability at any rate we choose, nor is it embodied in the house from the lumber of the trees, nor can we stockpile climate stability for later use. It is a fund service and it is non-rival. My consumption of climate stability does not impact your consumption of it. So forests provide all of these 17 different fund services that were listed just a moment ago in Table 6-1, to at least some degree. As we deplete or degrade complex ecosystems, we impact the fund services. And due to the complexity of ecosystem structure and functions, we really cannot predict what will happen with any reasonable probability. So when we ask such questions as where is the critical depensation point on the sustainability curve, we need to be aware that for a given stock, what are all of the fund services this stock relies on from the ocean or forest? And just as importantly, when we harvest too much of a stock from the ocean, we deplete all of the services that it provides. For example, even though it may not force that particular stock to its critical depensation point, it could impact some other stock that uses a fund service created by the depleting stock. We need to be humble, careful, and overcompensate when attempting to reconfigure nature. The consequences could be unforgiving.
The relationship between capital stock flow and fund service resources illustrates one of the most important concepts in ecological economics. As eloquently put by Daly and Farley, it is impossible to create something from nothing. All economic production requires flow of natural resources generated by a stock of natural capital. Even abiotic stocks, elements, and fossil fuels can only be extracted and consumed at some cost to the ecosystem. In other words, production requires inputs of ecosystem structure. Ecosystem structure generates ecosystem function, which in turn provides services. All economic production thus has an impact on ecosystem services, and because this impact is unavoidable, it is completely internal to the economic process. An excessive rate of flow extracted from a stock affects not only the stock and its ability to provide a flow in the future, but also the fund to which the stock contributes and the services that fund provides. We now turn to waste absorption capacity. Waste assimilation are ecosystem services that we tend to take for granted. And yet, without it, life could not continue. Waste absorption is an example of a fund service. And while we may be able to convert stock flow resources at our own pace and choosing while adhering to a sustainable yield curve, we must account for the waste sinks upon which stock flow resources rely. Economic processes that convert the harvests and other stock flow resources inherently generate waste. And while waste absorption capacity occurs only at a fixed rate, usage of stock flow is used as the economic system deems appropriate. Fundamentally, economic production implies the generation of waste, and waste absorption must be taken into account as a fundamental aspect of production. A forest is not simply a grove of trees. It is an ecosystem that provides critical services like water purification and recycling, carbon sequestration, all of which help support long-term climate stability. And when we use the trees for economic growth, we impact the entire ecosystem structure and functions, which include the waste absorption capacity of the system. This waste inflow is severely damaging to ecosystems and human beings as well in the long run. As the economy grows, it consumes and depletes non-renewable resources, which impacts and displaces many ecosystem functions and the important services they provide. The impact is synergistic in that removing one resource of a system degrades the remaining ecosystem structure and functions, potentially increasing waste outflows. For example, waste absorption has the potential to significantly impact global climate stability when you consider the amount of waste from CO2 and its impact on global warming, oceans, as well as the weather. Waste absorption capacity is a significant fund service that we must address as part of the equation when we consider continued economic growth. And while preserving the ecosystem's mechanisms for processing waste is complex, exceeding the point where waste inflows exceed the waste removal or outflows will result in a system that cannot recuperate on its own. We do not want to approach this point. And it should be mentioned that ecosystems do have a greater ability to process the waste from biological resources than from man-made chemical waste. Nature has had billions of years to learn how to remove wastes, but not so many years to learn how to remove our man-made chemical wastes. Consider the Great Pacific Garbage Patch as an example. Consider that 80% of the ocean trash originates on land and that 90% of ocean trash is plastic. In summary, we discussed three biotic resources in this lecture. This table helps to identify the economic characteristics of the three, the three being renewable resources, ecosystem services, and waste absorption capacity. We first considered renewable resources. These are stock flow resources and can be made to be excludable. For example, forests can be owned by warehouser and used as sources for lumber and profit. 
Renewable resources are also rival in that the rate of use impacts what can be consumed, for example, across generations. Ecosystem services, on the other hand, are considered fund services. It is very difficult to make them excludable and deny access to the ecosystem service, for example, like the benefits of pollination or climate stability. Ecosystem services are also not rival for the most part. Use of an ecosystem service does not prohibit use by anyone else, even between generations. Consider waste absorption. This is a fund service, and it can be made excludable. It is possible to establish institutions that make waste absorption excludable. Consider CO2, carbon permits, where the polity determine the upper limit on allowable CO2, then auction off trading permits where they can be traded in the market. Is waste absorption rival? Well, if a firm dumps pollution into a river, it reduces the capacity of the river to assimilate the waste at a cost to all downriver and even across generations, if the dumping should continue over time. The waste absorption capacity of the river could be, in fact, destroyed forever. This concludes Part 3, Ecosystem Services and Waste Absorption Capacity. This is Professor Anne Orion Spihar from the University of Alaska Southeast.